Welcome to RIT Sports Zone. I'm John Dettulio. You know, this week we look back at some of the biggest moments we've had on the show during our 13 years of award winning coverage of RIT Athletics. You know, Sports Zone began in the hopes of attracting more attention to the school's 24 varsity sports. Through an alumni connection with ESPN and our partnership with Time Warner Cable, the dream became a reality, and RIT Sports Zone hit the air in February 2002. I uh, took on the challenge of trying to develop a much bigger sports presence on campus uh, and to develop a relationship with ESPN and called upon an RIT alum down there by the name of Sean Bratches. Mm -hmm. He was an executive vice president at the time. He's certainly um, moved on now and has um, taken on a much bigger role at ESPN. But I laid this all out for him. And I was looking at the time to see if there could be a bridge between ESPN and, and RIT. Uh, wasn't quite sure exactly what I was asking for, but I wanted to bring the ESPN excitement to RIT. And so working with him, we came up with the idea of actually creating this television program. We thought it would be a great idea to have a sports center desk where RIT students could uh, get up and you know, either ad lib or kind of read a, um, a scripted highlight and then they can have some fun with it. We didn't even have a name for it. Any. I mean, when I got hired, I didn't even have a desk. It was just one of those things that was so brand new and so different and something the university hadn't really tried before um, that was um, really kind of... Uh, intriguing to me and I knew that um, if I did work here that we'd have the support of the university and having the backing of ESPN was a was a huge boon to us in the beginning. You came here in 2002 which in February of 2002 the first show aired. And I'm Joe Versage. Today we're kicking off our inaugural show about RIT and the diverse athletic programs it offers its students. How did that make you feel? That was great. <laughs> that was it was nerve-wracking. The reason it was so important for us is because um, I had, I, we, we literally had a handful of students working for us at that time. Um, there was l literally, I think, three students that and myself were doing Sports Zone at that time. That first episode was a real um, eye-opener, and it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of work, a lot of long, long hours. It's only a couple of months. We went from literally zero to putting a show on the air. And again, we didn't have any high expectations for our first show. We just wanted to get out there and get our name done. We didn't have very much graphics. We didn't have a lot of the things that we have to take for granted now today. Right from the beginning, the point of it was the students were working on projects that they wanted to work on. And, and the athletics department, the, the people that we interviewed at that time in the early uh, stages, were just grateful to, to show their programs, to show their sports, um, and to uh, get some exposure. Uh, in, uh, in Rochester, that was fantastic. Did you have any doubts about the production of the show when it first started? Oh, absolutely. Once I saw after a few episodes that uh, these kids had it, you know, nailed uh, and we had great on-air talent to help guide it. Um, John Tatulio has been an exceptional mentor for a lot of our students from day one. Uh, he came in and immediately added an air of professionalism that, you know, was instantaneous. I breathed a great sigh of relief because I just knew that it was going to be successful. And it was because of this that we've launched into the live broadcasting business, uh, which we started this fall uh, for all of our uh, hockey games. And uh, during the course of this year and next, we're going to expand that into the other uh, sports here at RIT. Did you ever envision that Sports Zone would be where it is today? It's hard, to, it's hard to gauge because you don't know where it's going to end up. You know, it's like it, there's nothing before it to give you a gauge of where we're going to be. Um, did I think we we're going to last seven seasons and a hundred episodes? I really didn't think that was going to happen. I, I, I don't know why. I, um, it's been successful. We've won awards. We had support from the university. The students do a phenomenal job on the show. Um, but I just thought... It, it, I, Again, the creative aspect, I wanted to keep it changing, evolving, and, and being different. Um, and, and we're forced to do that no matter what with students because you guys are always here for four years and then you're out and then there's another group of people that come in. And that's great because there's always uh, fresh ideas and new invention coming in and that really has helped a lot. Those, those first initial four students turned into 10, which turned into 20, which turned into almost 100 students that work for us today. I know that there are um, literally dozens of uh, former students who have gone on to great careers. You know, it's extremely gratifying to see um, this thing emerge uh, from the standpoint that students came here perhaps with a certain discipline in mind, and when they got here and they saw this great experience, they actually found their passion, you know, and they've gone on now to careers where they're excited, they're contributing, um, they've been able to demonstrate to those companies the value of an RIT degree, 
uh, and how highly trained and highly educated they come out of here and prepared for the workforce. I think you know one other benefit of the ES, the sports zone at RIT, is the fact that you know being live and e even the segments that aren't being distributed and disseminated to uh, throughout Time Warner cable systems upstate New York is a great recruiting vehicle, uh, and it's a great I think um, a value element that reinforces you know the value of the R of you know the RIT experience and gives somebody you know today something a little bit more material to hold on to and and uh, keep as a keepsake. Yeah, I think it's been far greater um, than I expected uh, as far as the contribution, the awards that the show wins in these national uh, competitions, uh, and the student programs have won year after year. So they've done a terrific job. Um, and uh, that, that speaks to the quality of the folks we have. You know, you, you, you see your children, and, or my children, and they're like this, and then, you know, then you turn around and they're like this. It's the same thing with Sports Zone. It's like, it, all of a sudden we're doing our 20th episode, now we're doing our 80th, then 100th, and it's like, wow, where, where'd the time go? And so that's, that's, been, that's been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of work, but it's been a, lot, a labor of love. Welcome back to Sports Zone. RIT hasn't fielded a team to play one of America's most beloved sports since 1978. Decades later, fans are still disappointed RIT hasn't returned to the gridiron, and so has one of the school's former coaches. We flash back to the summer of 2010 when SE went one on one with the man who built the Tigers program and has since become a giant in coaching. This is what life is like for New York Giants head coach Tom Coughlin. A major difference from when he took over the reins at RIT 40 years ago. I came up to RIT, I had the interview with Lou, um, he offered me the job. Uh, so starting a program over with all the details that are involved, you know, I did everything. I did the yeah. travel, I did the equipment buying, we did the everything you could think of with a, with a part-time staff. We had yeah. part-time coaches at the time and I was the only full-time guy. But it was a great move for me. The coach also did the team's laundry and painted the yard markers on the field. But he admits his biggest challenge was filling the roster. <laughs> the challenges really were getting players. I mean, we were recruiting uh, players. You know, I can remember walking into a school, into a high school, and the coach would say, uh, do you want to sit down and look at film? And i say, film. All I want to do is know is, who do you have that can qualify to get into a great school like RIT and who can play the game and wants to play at the exactly. college level? So I would go to six or seven schools uh, during the course of a day just trying to accumulate numbers. I'd stand out on the, on the walkway over from the dormitories and just look for, for kids. I remember Bruce Kohout walking by and I grabbed Bruce. He was a nice looking big old guy. And asked him if he ever played you know, high school football and he said yes and so I talked him into than to coming out for the, for the varsity team. But there were a lot of guys like that. Now, in your early years at RIT, how did that shape you as a, the coach you are today? Well, I think that the shaping had come a little bit earlier when I played at Syracuse for Ben Schwartzwalder and how Coach Schwartzwalder ran his program. And uh, I thought maybe this is something that I might want to do. And so I would start to think along those lines. And even as a player at Syracuse, I thought along those lines. And uh, so uh, the, the, the style just kind of came naturally because of the experiences that I had. At Syracuse, we were very physical. You know, we ran the ball, we played great defense, and we, we rushed and played from a 5-3 front, and uh, that's where the style began. During his four seasons at RIT, Coughlin didn't field a Division Three powerhouse, but the Tigers held their own, going 16-15-1. I remember playing against great football teams. I mean, we played against the Hobart team that had the two leading rushers in Division Three one time. We tied them. I was real proud of, of, the, uh, of the way in which our players rose from the club level to the varsity level against Alfred and Ithaca and St. Lawrence and Hobart and some really, Brockport, some really good uh, football teams, well manned, well coached, a lot of, a lot of uh, players um, and our guys stood up very well against that competition. The sacrifices those kids made were, were amazing, you know, when you stop and think about the purity of the sport. At that level, there was no one on scholarship. There was really no, no one on aid. Uh, they were there because of the academics of the school and the opportunity to play and, of course, the location. 
Tom Coughlin took great pride in building a varsity football program at RIT. However, decades later, the Super Bowl winning coach is still disappointed the Tigers program was disbanded. It's, it's disappointing because it is a historical uh, part of, of, the, of our past and uh, certainly would have liked to have seen the program continue. I know that it continued for a couple of years. Um, similar to, I guess, what it happened in World War II. I think they had football at a time and then they had to drop it. But uh, it was disappointing. Um, I knew Lou Spiotti was the head football coach at the time when that happened. And uh, I know it, it had to be disappointing for Lou as well. Forty years after starting his coaching career, Coughlin is still at it. The 64-year-old coach is in his seventh season with the New York Giants. Plenty has changed in his profession, but the coach has remained the same and hopes to be remembered fondly when he calls it quits. Lastly, if you had to write the final chapter of your coaching career, how would it end and how would you like to be remembered? <laughs> well, it, I'd like to win uh, our, for our team, the New York Giants, to win another Super Bowl. That would be nice. Uh, but I would like to be remembered as a guy who was very thorough, uh, very detailed. Uh, talked about team exclusively, not about individuals, but about the we rather than the me. Someone who cared about his players, uh, someone who could, uh, you know, who uh, learned as he grew in the, in, in the game, just as I think you grow in life in every capacity that you're in, adjusted his style, if you will, to the, uh, to the players and the circumstances of the day. And, uh, you know, and, and, and really, got people to play to the best of their ability. That's the, the important thing is that we all, whatever we choose to do in life, that we do it to the best of our ability. And if we can do that, I think then, uh, then uh, it's something that's worthwhile remembering. Welcome back to Sports Zone. Matt Hamill was the first deaf wrestler to win a national collegiate championship, and the former RIT student was the first deaf person to participate in mixed martial arts. Through the years, Hamill's been an inspiration to many, overcoming adversity to make his dreams come true. Today, we flash back to the fall of 2011 when Hamill's life story finally hit the big screen. Okay, we're rolling and Action. It's been over two years since the bright lights of Hollywood came to RIT to feature one of our own. He was always the center of attention and wherever we went, wherever we traveled, you know, people, you could always hear him whisper under their breath, you know, oh, that's Matt Hamill, you know, I've got to watch him wrestle. Matt Hamill, a former RIT NTID student and three-time Division III wrestling champion, first caught Hollywood producers' attention when he became a contestant on the Ultimate Fighter reality show. My riding partner, Eben Kaspar, uh, saw it on the UFC reality show a few years back. Thought it'd be, he thought Matt was an inspiring uh, guy himself, and uh, we looked into it. We tracked him down, met him, interviewed him. Um, thought it'd be a good idea for a script, and wrote the script. I think the, the writing process was difficult to, in the beginning because to try and have uh, explain to someone that we're going to write your life story, but we're going to just fit it in a three-act structure and an hour-and-a-half film. Combine your dad and your yeah. grandfather into one character. Not only is his story unique, but the final result is the first of its kind. And cut! One of the really cool things I think that we've been thinking about this project from the beginning is it's going to be totally subtitled. So the hearing people will be able to hear the English, but they'll have to read the subtitles for the ASL and vice versa for the deaf people. I told you your whole life, you don't need to be treated different. But I am different. There aren't a lot of movies that you can go to the theater and watch hearing and deaf together unless they're foreign films because the deaf people need the subtitles. So it's kind of this one-of-a-kind movie where, where deaf people and hearing people can watch it together in the theater. After years of production, the movie titled The Hammer, after Hamill himself, has already won eight film festival awards and has finally hit the big screen in over a hundred theaters nationwide. I'm going to tell you you have a highly intelligent grandson who's profoundly deaf. <laughs> well, 
already we've uh, we've went eight for eight in film festivals, which is awesome. I think it was uh, AFI in California, Maui, uh, Cleveland. We just wanted to, to hit the right audiences and kind of bridge the gap and, and have it be a um, blindside meets Rocky meets Rudy type of film. We knew the film was special from the beginning, and everybody's been involved with it. You know, especially uh, I myself was very late in the process, but it's been phenomenal to see that everybody else is coming out and supporting it. And the vast majority of those awards came not from critics, but they came from the audience members themselves who love the film and just want to see it succeed. What's it like for you, just this feeling that you have now that your life is made into a movie? Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's something that, um, it's so weird. It's really weird because, I mean, it was a strange thing to me. I mean, I didn't expect to go this far. I, I mean, let's go back a little bit. This movie, uh, The Hammer, it took us six years for the project. I thought, you know, it won't be really special or that. I thought it might be really short the one there, but I realized the movie producers did not give up. But overall, you know, what I feel like is, wow, it's very special, you know. It's a special moment, you know, to have someone, you know, about my life showing them around the world, and it's, it's really amazing. Hamill's story will certainly serve as an inspiration to both the deaf and hearing community. You know, I hope that they just enjoy the film and feel good about it. You know, obviously the message is overcoming struggles at any point in your life. Um, I haven't seen the film until tonight, but the parts I've seen are really uplifting. And, um, you know, it's a great message, and I think it comes at a, a pretty cool time. Although Matt Hamill has achieved so much in his life, at the young age of 35, he says there is still more to come. I'm still retired from New York State, you know, but I'm going to see what happens after Christmas. I tore on a rotator cut. You know, so I'm just let you know, you know, let it flow, see how to go from there. I'm 35, you know, so yeah. I don't want to be clear when I get older, you know, so I'm just hoping there might be a little bit of spark, you know, open door I could get in. So. But right now, I'm just having to take care of my body. You're a motivational speaker, you're a UFC fighter, you can speak six languages. Like, for you, what is your biggest accomplishment? Well, I'm still not that fine. I'm still not that fine, you know. Other people can see my eyes, you know. I'm just not really happy, but I still have more to prove from around the world, you know. I still have something to prove. Welcome back to Sports Zone. RIT elevated its men's hockey program to the Division I level in 2005. And just five years later, the Tigers delivered one of the most memorable seasons in school history. We flash back to 2010 to relive RIT's improbable run to the Frozen Four. The Tigers begin the season in front of the largest home crowd in RIT's history. 7,421 fans filled the stands of the Blue Cross Arena on Brick City weekend. Buzzer Burt winding up, the shot, and Todd's going to run out on the Tigers. It definitely frustrating, leaves a bitter taste in our mouths that we should have buried the puck and should have won. But uh, hopefully over time we figure out how to put that puck in the back of the net. I think in order to, to win something, it, it's, it's a lot of effort, a lot of hard work. and. Our players realize that and they do that. Uh, they work very, very hard for everything they've achieved and I know that if they don't, then they're probably gonna lose the game. Go, Hulky stay right on him. Yeah. Win the period, no friendlies, get everyone involved here and be strong in the finisher. Let's go now, let's finish the job. An opportunity. Babbitt walking in. Great defensive play by Sellers from behind a poke check and one away. Goal! Goal! Maisie! Maisie! The Tigers are the regular season champions of Atlantic hockey. Fantastic. Today, the left wing won the game in overtime. How did you feel about that? Oh, you know, relieving. I had a couple chances in the third there I should have buried, but I didn't get it done, so. Got it, to get her done at home in front of the home crowd and from a packed house, pretty special. Our RIT Tigers took center stage for the first time ever in the Atlantic Hockey Finals. All this stood in their way of the conference championship with the familiar faces of the Sacred Heart Pioneers. Five seconds to 
go. Celebrate RIT, celebrate Rochester, New York. The Tigers, for the first time, are going to the NCAA tournament. You heard the place in here after we won. It was, it was pretty loud and everyone's real excited. So, um, you know, a lot of people, you know, they know that we're on the map and we know that we're a good team, but hopefully we can make some more noise in the tournament. Zone backhands in front, slots up by Murphy. No rebound. Score! Stephen Maddock, the Cinderella story of the tournament so far. The Rochester Institute of Technology out of Rochester, New York. They're going dancing to the Frozen Four in Detroit. expected this is this I mean, I'm not lost the words We don't think about underdog, overdog. I mean, you can call us Snoop Dogg. We really could care last thing. RIT taking on Wisconsin. Now we're racing the other way. Vandekson again in drags it. And it gets the puck and it scores! Badgers just trying to run it out as they send it around the boards. Congratulations, Wisconsin. I think it put uh, RIT in the spotlight, and uh, I'm very, very proud of uh, of, of our year and of our team, and, and this game will not diminish any of it. Well, that does it for this edition of RIT Sports Zone. Don't forget, you can stay up to date with Sports Zone by following us on Twitter and Instagram, liking us on Facebook, or by downloading our app on your Android or Apple device. So until next time, thanks for joining us here in the Zone.